Hi, everybody. Welcome to My Favorite Mistake. I'm Mark Raven. We're joined today, um, you might say, my favorite professor from my days at MIT. He is Arnold Barnett. And before I tell you more about him, I imagine Arnold is what you call you get called when you're in trouble because mo most everyone calls you Arnie, right? Well, either is fine. My mother always called me Arnold. Yeah. So Arnie, thank you um, for being here. And um, Arnie is the George Eastman Professor of Management Science. He's a professor of statistics at the MIT Sloan School of Management. Um, he has a BA in mathematics from Columbia and a PhD in mathematics from MIT. Um, his research specialty is applied mathematical modeling with a focus on problems of health and safety. Uh, he's been cited as the nation's leading expert on aviation safety. I've heard him de uh, described that way many times. Uh, he was recognized with the 2002 president citation from the Flight Safety Foundation for truly outstanding contributions on behalf of safety. And MIT Sloan students have honored him on 14 occasions for outstanding teaching. So that's not just me or earlier, my, my wife, who was also a student, uh, we're, we're, we're in that camp and we know other students have agreed with us. We're not a statistical anomaly, I guess. So one other memory, um, just real quick, um, and Arnie, you, um, you, you may well remember this too. Um, the summer of 1997, um, in the, that first summer of, of the leadership manufacturing program class, you, you informed us that our next class was canceled because you'd been invited to a meeting with the vice president. So we all thought that was a perfectly fine uh, reason to be away. It, I, I probably was lying, but <laughs> it, it must have sounded like a good, good excuse. Well, I, the, the lie was very specific, which makes it believable. This is back when they, they were looking at the question of bag match for passengers and checked baggage. Yeah, I think that's true. But I think I probably postponed the class. I don't think I would have canceled it because you people pay pretty sizable tuitions to be at MIT. So I don't think professors have a right to announce I'm too busy for you. <laughs> well, it was for the, the greater good. And education is a weird product where sometimes people are happier to get less of it for the same money. But Well, I hope my class was not an example of that. <laughs> no, no. We get a lot of value and a lot of great lessons out of um, your class and in your teaching. So, you know, I have some you know questions that I'll want to ask you um, later uh, later on about statistics or mistakes people or businesses or governments make um, with with mistakes. But we always uh, start off first here with this question. So I'm going to ask you, Arnie, thinking back to your career, what would you say is your favorite mistake? Well, let me describe it. The, it. It is a little bit obnoxious, as you'll hear, to describe it this way. But I'm trying to answer your question honestly. It is my favorite mistake. Mm -hmm. As you've already mentioned, Mark, I have an interest in aviation safety and have written papers on the subject using statistical principles to make sense of safety records. And one of the points I endlessly made was that that bad crashes of airplanes, particularly in a place like the United States, are extremely rare events. And when events are rare, the observed statistics can be highly misleading. You know, let me give an example. Suppose I have a coin that's fair, okay, and I toss it twice. Well, there are four possible outcomes. Heads, 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 tails, tails, heads, tails, tails. All four are equally likely. So in other words, there's a 50% chance you're going to get a double head or a double tail. Mm -hmm. Now, if someone were to say, look, two heads in a row, the coin can't be fair. That, of course, would be a highly misleading conclusion, because even if the coin is fair, that was not in the least a rare outcome. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the points I kept stressing when people would say, wow, this airline has two crashes. This one has none. And therefore, the one that you really want to fly is the one without crashes. Well, even if they're equally safe, the same number of flights under the same conditions, it basically one of the airlines having the two crashes is like two, two heads for the fair coin if they're equally safe. So you, you shouldn't jump to conclusions. Back in 1994, U.S. Air, well, it eventually became U.S. Airways before it was absorbed into American Airlines. U.S. Air had had a number of crashes in quick succession. 
And I have been saying, you know, this could be just a temporary spasm of bad luck. I mean, if you toss a fair coin every now and then, you get several heads in a row. Mm -hmm. But then on, on, in September 1994, there was a U.S. air crash at Pittsburgh that, that killed, I believe, 150 people. And I had not known about it until I got a call that day from a reporter for the New York Times, with whom I'd spoken a little bit about aviation statistics in the past. And he said, you know, there's just been a bad crash on U.S. air. So I blurted out, U.S. air again? That's amazing. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, having made this holy cow comment, I tried a little bit to walk it back and say, of course, with rare events, you know, things can happen. But he had his quote. And on page one of the Times, he had the quote, U.S. air again? That's amazing. Well, I started getting comments, even though I really didn't want to say that. I blurted it out. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember someone wrote to me, it's, it's nice that finally someone is willing to talk straight. And, you know, remember what Harry Truman used to say? I, he wished that there were one-handed economists because he was sick and tired of having them say on the one hand, on the other hand. Okay. On the same way, I think people are used to academics saying, we must take into account all the contextual factors, including the historical and uh, metaphysical elements. So basically to have someone say, gosh, that's amazing, that struck them as a breath of fresh air. Mm. I, I got a torrent of requests to speak that day from newspapers, from uh, I guess the radio stations and whatnot. Uh, shortly thereafter, I was invited to the Today Show and I was interviewed by Katie Couric about aviation safety. And in general, actually, I got a lot of attention because of that mistake. Mm -hmm. And then I, I think it helped, to be honest, again, I don't mean to be obnoxious, that it helps solidify my reputation as one of these go-to guys when you have issues about aviation safety statistics. Mm -hmm. So I was invited to be on a part of projects about mid-air collisions, about collisions on airport runways, and especially about aviation security and experiments such as the one you'd mentioned earlier today about whether bags should be matched to passengers in the interests of aviation security. And I think it's, I can say literally that my career benefited from that mistake, but it was a mistake. And to the extent that it contributed to the sense that U.S. Airways was less safe, you know, it may be that it did have some harm in this to U.S. Air, that it contributed a little bit, maybe just a little bit to the aversion to fly U.S. Air, which certainly mm -hmm. arose after the Pittsburgh crash, which was the fifth crash in five years. So, and of course it is true that even though something could be a fluctuation, that doesn't mean it has to be. Mm. I mean, sometimes the reason you have so many crashes is that you're not as safe. But anyway, that is my favorite mistake. I will tell you though, I'm not saying this is out of guilt, but in the next 20 years, US Airways had not only a perfect safety record, it carried a billion passengers without a single fatality, but there were three circumstances where heroic actions by U.S. Airways pilots prevented, right. you know, a terrible, including, of course, the miracle on the Hudson was one right. of them. Right, right. But there right. were two others. There was one case where the controller said, take off, and the U.S. Air pilot said, I don't think we will, because we're not sure about that plane that just landed. And even though the controller got very, got kind of abusive, they said, we're waiting until that plane is at the at, at its gate. And it turns out that the plane was right ahead of the U.S. airplane on the runway in the fog. Yeah. And if they had followed the air traffic controller, they would have smashed into it. So anyway, so I did write that mm -hmm. saying you, when it, it was absorbed by American Airlines, U.S. air leaves in triumph. Mm. But there was that mistake. As I said, I blurted something out. And indeed, had I heard about it earlier that day, so that when the reporter called, I had a considered response, I wouldn't have said that. Right. But I did wind up saying it, and it did wind up help. You You quoted certain things about how I was taken seriously for aviation safety. Mm -hmm. Ironically, it was what I blurted out, which was not mm -hmm. terribly scientific, which may have contributed to that. So, strange world.
Well, it's a very interesting story, Arnie. I mean, I think it falls in that category. You know, there, there are some favorite mistake stories that people tell where it, it, it's a mistake that ended up leading, you know, to, to some unexpected doors opening or, you know, a career taking a path that might not have otherwise been exactly the same. Um, I mean, I, I don't, I don't find it, it I, you know, an obnoxious story. I think it, it's a, it's an interesting reflection of, of how a moment like that um, can lead to things. I mean, I would argue that there's societal benefit to people asking for your um, statistical analysis, that it wasn't all just about publicity or attention or, or what have you. I don't think there's too much to apologize for. I, I understand the dyma- dynamic there. Like you said, you blurted it out. Yeah, well, you know, they say, I think Michael Kinsley once said in Washington, a gaffe is when a politician accidentally tells the truth. <laughs> so I think there may have been a sense that I was telling the truth. Well, it was true in the sense that, look, if you have five crashes in five years, the natural reaction is, what is going on here? Yeah. And to say, well, maybe it's just bad luck. Yes, maybe it's just bad luck, but maybe there's a real problem. So in that sense, I probably had the same reaction as an awful lot of other people. Mm -hmm. And so maybe airing it out by making it legitimate, at least to raise the question, you could say maybe that was a a good thing. Mm -hmm. Because if the experts are always telling us things that we have a sense aren't true, then we pay less attention to the so-called experts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, did it ever get back to you directly or indirectly? Was anybody at U.S. Airways mad at you? Yes. Uh, In particular, there was a pilot from a southern state who wrote to me saying, uh, among other things, he said, you have dishonored me in front of my family. And I was thinking, gee, I'm glad I'm not there. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad that Massachusetts has gun control, et cetera. And his wife, who ironically, I believe, was an alcoholic, started calling me. And then actually called the dean of the Sloan School Mm. and said, I thought you'd like to know that your faculty members are making idiots of themselves. Yikes. You know, actually, to be honest, not to complicate the story, that was part based on something I said with Katie Couric. Mm -hmm. But that would not have that would not have happened, that that interview, were it not for the the holy cow comment. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, but there was uh, I, I was concerned about that Mm -hmm. because when you said you have dishonored me in front of my family you know you think the next thing you're going to be invited to a duel (laughs) right or at least slapped across the face with a glove yeah but i did i did write to them actually to Uh the uh to the family and i said i know you're unhappy and i and i i pointed out actually when i did talk i think later that day to newsweek I had said that I suspected it was only, you know, a spasm of bad luck. Mm -hmm. So I pointed out to them that I was not, you know, going out of my way to blame U.S. Air. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, believe me, no one is rooting for U.S. Air now more than I am. Of course, that's a a stupid thing to say. I'm sure the people U.S. Airways were infinitely rooting for it, and rightfully so. The ironic thing is, if the crash wasn't U.S. Air's fault, mm-hmm. it was some problem with the rudder of the Boeing 737. And any airline that flew it could have been the first to lose a plane because of that problem. And Southwest had more 737s than U.S. Air. So statistically, you might have thought when the problem manifested itself, it would have been on Southwest. Right. Or it could have been on United. Actually, United had had a previous 737 crash because of the rudder. But it hadn't been recognized at that point. So there really was, it really was an element of bad luck. And US Airways employees, some of its experts were instrumental in finding the cause of that crash. Hmm. So it really did turn out to be an airline that had suffered bad luck, had an, mm-hmm. a perfect record from that point on. Yeah. So, so but then anyway, as you say, a favorite mistake. Again, I do I wish I had been more in control. Yes, but on the other hand, I noticed that well, sometimes, sometimes you get you get lucky. Not that you want to get lucky in connection with tragedies, right? Right. And I wonder if there's a mistake in either the use of or the interpretation of the word 
amazing. I, I just went and did a quick dictionary search. I, I, I think like, the word amazing is often used in a very positive context. Like, you know, somebody makes 10 out of 12 three pointers in a game and they might say, oh, an amazing performance by uh, mm-hmm. Steph Curry. But the dictionary definition, it sounds like this is how you were using the word. At least one definition says causing great surprise or wonder, semicolon, astonishing, which, I mean, that sounds like that really was your reaction. But this is um, great surprise, not, oh, great. Yes, that's right. I I certainly did not mean it to squeal with joy that U.S. Air had another crash. Right. Of course. You know. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, amazing being, amazed being stunned. Sure, yeah, but saying that's stunning, that that looks differently in print. I'm not trying to wordsmith you here or, you know, but. Uh, yeah, no, um, he got the quote. Mm-hmm. He had a right to it. I didn't, um, maybe if I had said, please don't quote me, he might have decided to oblige, but f- frankly, I forgot to say it. Yeah. Anyway, so, and then, uh, so when you talk about how, uh, I'm described as a safety expert. It's in part because of that deviation from scientific mm. expertise. Mm. Wow. I mean, it sounds like there's also a lesson there about talking with the press. You've been interviewed countless times here. And, you know, there's this question of asking to go off the record, asking to go on background. I think there's one lesson more broadly here of you, 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 you can't ask for that permission after the fact. You can't say something and then say, oh, by the way, this is off the record. It, it seems like it doesn't work that way. You know, I have had positive interactions with the press. I very rarely, if ever, have been misquoted. In fact, sometimes I'm impressed how carefully they quote things. Mm -hmm. And there was a circumstance, Mark, where I remember I was doing something that involved aviation safety. And I was working on an experiment, a security experiment uh, involving, I think it was involving, let's say, American Airlines. I don't think this is a secret now. And I got a call from someone from the Washington Post. And I said something you know, and, and then I realized after I had said it and after we had hung up that if I were identified as the person who said that, it would make it harder for me to continue in the security experiment. Mm-hmm. So I did call the reporter back and I said, I'm incredibly sorry, but could you perhaps basically treat it as off the record, even though I hadn't said it? And he did. Mm, okay. He did. So I haven't had bad experiences with with people. Yeah. You know, I mean, to be honest, when you get people from organizations like the New York Times or the Washington Post or the Wall Street Journal or the what used to be the major news networks, uh, they're pretty they're pretty serious. Yeah. So I don't think that I, I have any any complaints. And I think sometimes, you know, the media gets a bad rap for the obvious reason that sometimes they say things that people would rather not be said. And yeah. there will be obviously tendency people will say, never mind what they said, look at look at how they should never have said it. Yeah, yeah. Um, one other question, Arnie, for you about aviation safety and probabilities. Um, I remember you would talk about how bad we are, we are sometimes at estimating the risk of, we're recording this right before Memorial Day weekend. And a lot of people might decide, you know, if I, if I was going from, Detroit to Chicago, is it safer to drive or to fly? And I remember you you had some math around that. I'm, I'm curious how the math has changed of where, where, where is the break-even point between driving safety and flying risk or safety? Well, that's that's an interesting question, particularly Detroit, Chicago is about 200 miles. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one of the sources of risk now, if you fly, is the danger of coming down with COVID. Mm. You know, the the planes are full and now masking is optional. And I know the last time I flew, maybe 15 percent of the passengers were wearing masks and none of the crew. I was wearing a mask Mm -hmm. and I thought based on what the CDC was saying, people should have been wearing masks, but they weren't. So in other words, you have to consider when you talk about the risk, part of the risk of flying now is coming down with COVID either in the airport or on the airplane. Mm -hmm. And of course, if it's your own car with your own family, the chances are there's 
no incremental risks. And given the 200 miles is only a little over three hours, it's right. not that you have to make lots of stops on the way where you would be subject to risk going into stores and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Anyway, having said that, I would say I don't think there's any safety advantage to flying rather than driving for that distance, assuming you were doing it on the interstate, maybe the interstate 90, it might be. Hmm. And uh, because interstate driving is extremely safe. You know, we have in Massachusetts, the Massachusetts Turnpike, which goes from east to west. We're a kind of small state. It's only about 130 miles from east to west. But there are millions upon millions of cars that use it over the course of the year. And in a typical year, there isn't a single fatality on the Massachusetts Turnpike. So what I'm saying is, if you look at driving like that, you realize that it's really quite safe. Flying, except for COVID, is extraordinarily safe, of course, in the United States. You know, accidents that involve crashes have been pushed almost to the break of extinction. Mm -hmm. Almost, yeah, to the, the verge of extinction, I guess I should say. So I wouldn't worry. I, mean, I, I would think either way is remarkably safe. But if you're flying, wear an N95 mask mm -hmm. and don't talk to the person next to you, whatever. Don't take your mask off. If they give you a snack for that short flight, put it in your bag and eat it. Eat, eat the, the, the peanuts or the, the biscuit after you get off the plane. If you do that, I think you're pretty safe. Yeah. Well, I want to come back to the mask um, topic in a second, but thinking about risk, does um, the risk of an accident when you're driving kind of increase linearly with the, the amount of time you're on the road? Maybe if you've driven a really long day, it might increase mm -hmm. more than linearly. Um, is that fair to assume? Or there, it, it probably depends on all sorts of things, the congestion of the roads and what road it is. Mm hmm. Well, I think, first of all, what you're saying could well make sense that you are more fatigued. I don't I haven't seen data that actually break down accidents by how long the driver had been behind the wheel mm. before the accident occurred. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised, though, if we could get such data, if we saw something of an effect of what you mentioned, namely that fatigue comes in. Certainly, I think fatigue can be one of the reasons that one has that. Well, if you look at the causes of accidents, I don't think there are that many that are attributed to fatigue per, te per se, mm -hmm. but I certainly think that if you're fatigued, your reaction time is lower, is higher, I should say. Right. And so I think there would be greater risk, but I, I haven't seen statistics that document that. Yeah. I mean, I have seen, and, and, and that's spoken um, truly like, you know, an MIT statistics professor to, to point to, you know, uh, seeing the data or not seeing the data, that's different than whether the data exists out there in the wild. But there, there is data that I've seen, if you look at fatigue in healthcare, mm -hmm. working the 11th and 12th hours of a nursing nursing shift, mm -hmm. that, that errors do uh, spike in, in what seems like a statistically meaningful way, which could probably be correlated with fatigue, there, there's also the risk of correlation versus causation mistakes. No, I, I think you're absolutely right when I say we, we don't have the data. On the other hand, as you also say, things are complicated because let's say you're driving from, let's say, Detroit to Chicago, and after 100 miles, you go in and get a coffee. Well, then you might be more alert in the third and fourth hour mm -hmm. than you were in the first and second. Mm -hmm. So in other words, if you really wanted to consider all the things that come up, you know, it gets very complicated. But I, I haven't seen the data. But I agree with you. Fatigue itself certainly is not good. Well, I know that when even when I play these video games, I play text twist, the word game. Yeah. And I know when I play it, when I'm tired, I, I really don't get as many words per minute as when I'm alert. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and of course, if you're playing a video game while you're driving, that itself is a source of risk. <laughs> yes, there there are laws and regular regulations maybe around, let's say, you know, uh, semi truck drivers, where I believe they are limited. I, I wonder this this could be just uh, we we can wonder and let it go at that. If if there was data, or if it just seemed to some to lawmakers or regulators reasonable that a certain number of hours per day was the limit on safe driving. 
Um, well, I don't know the specifics. I think you might say intuitively it makes sense. And in the absence of data, maybe you should go with what makes sense. Mm. You have to remember the trucking industry was deregulated. Mm. And that meant that some of these truckers were under an awful lot of pressure to do an awful lot of driving. And the government may have felt it had to step in, lest you know, the free market create a situation that was unsafe. Mm-hmm. for sure. the drivers who are being ex- maybe even exploited in a sense and being told you got to get it from Detroit to New York in one day and I don't want to hear any excuses sure you know, and if you don't do it you're not going to get a, the next time an opportunity to to drive my stuff so so I don't know the specifics of that and I don't know the statistics sure um one other question about um you know flying safety um, with or without the COVID dynamic is, is uh, I, I could be misremembering. It was a long time ago when I was in your class, but thinking of the risk of, of going up and coming down. Yeah, well, coming about, down. Yeah. Thinking about a flight of 200 miles versus 2,000 miles. There's still one up, one down. Does that have an impact on the relative risk on shorter flights or longer flights? Well, it certainly seems you're right that statistically most pure accidents take place on landing or takeoff. Or I should say that the takeoff climb and the, or the descent landing phase is that in the cruise phase, accidents are very rare. They're not, it's not at all the case that they're non-existent. But so in that sense, a 2,000 mile flight is not 10 times as risky as a 200 mile flight. However, you see, we have to talk about all the sources of risk. For example, if we talk about 9-11, I don't think it's an accident that they chose transcontinental flights, mm-hmm. you know, that would be flying at higher altitudes, et cetera. So, and they may want to have a little bit more leeway so that if something takes longer or that the, the plane is not, you know, on the ground at the time something went wrong. For example, the bombing of Pan Am 103, this was a flight from London to New York, mm-hmm. and they arranged that the bomb would go off about an hour into the flight when it was at, at high altitude. And when you're at high altitude, the explosive decompression is not survivable. If you're at lower altitude, it is. In fact, you may remember the underwear bomber mm-hmm. was trying to bomb uh, what was then a Northwest Airlines flight going into Detroit. Well, he attempted to ignite the bomb when the plane was at something like 12,000 feet. Mm -hmm. And it is said, and I believe it to be true, that even if he had succeeded, he didn't succeed, of course, he would not have destroyed the plane Mm -hmm. because the force of decompression at 12,000 feet is not enough to destroy the plane. Mm -hmm. It's just it it creates a hole, but it doesn't cause the plane to plunge, etc. So for that reason, you could say it was more important, it might be more important to terrorists to go to longer flights Mm -hmm. than shorter ones. And in the, if to the extent that that's a source of risk, you know, there, you might say that longer flights are a little bit more dangerous than shorter ones, taking everything into account. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask you uh, about a piece and I'll, I'll link to this in uh, the show notes. Um, You wrote a piece in March, late uh, March 31st, 2022, the headline was don't end the mask mandate for U.S. airlines. You said ending the requirement now would be a serious mistake. And I ask this to somebody who still does wear a KN95 mask on board and your, right. 15, your 15% estimate seems uh, pretty accurate. Um, what, what was the statistical basis for saying that then? And it, it sounds like you still agree with that statement or, or when, when, when would the statistics show What would you look for in the data to say maybe that's not necessary at some point? Well, part of what I was doing was reacting to what U.S. airlines were saying. And U.S. airlines do a fabulous job of preventing crashes. But to other sources of risk, I don't think they especially distinguish themselves. And United Airlines had said that the risk of getting COVID-19 on United flight was was nearly non-existent, quote unquote, and Southwest Airlines, not to be outdone, said that it was virtually non-existent. Well, it's not non-existent. And what I pointed to in terms of data in that article was the many flights overseas in which 
we have evidence in the peer-reviewed medical literature that an infected person caused COVID to many others on the plane, to several others. Now, not everyone, you have to be seated pretty close to the infected passenger. It is true that the planes have good uh, air, air, air purification systems. Right. So if I'm in seat 8A and someone is infected in 20B, it's extremely unlikely this will affect me. But if the infected person is in 20B, well, that's not great news for the person in 20A or 20C right. or 21B. So but I have done calculations, but I, I cited several instances there. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the earliest examples was a passenger on a flight from London to Vietnam, air, an air Viet, Vietnam air, Airlines was infected with COVID-19. And of the 12 business class passengers within two rows of her, 11 of them came down with COVID on the flight, okay? And whereas other business class passengers who were further away from her, the risk was, I think, one in nine or something. Mm -hmm. And I remember the airlines, bless them, were saying, oh, they got infected in the lounge before they got on the plane. It had nothing to do with the plane, they hinted. Mm -hmm. But, you know, does that really make sense? I mean, uh, unless you believe that people arrange themselves in the lounge in the same configuration as, <laughs> as on the plane, right. why would you assume that only the ones who are close by on the plane were close enough in the lounge? So I think that, so there were several examples like that. And the U.S. airlines, I think, frankly, they pretend that such examples don't exist. Or they say, well, these are outliers. Of course, we don't have actual data from the United States because we have such a poor system of finding out about COVID. I mean, how many people came down with COVID in the United States in bowling alleys or on local buses or on planes? We have no idea how many got on the vehicles carrying COVID and certainly no idea which people caught COVID on the plane. In fact, even the people who did, they can't be sure. sure. I have a neighbor who believes she came down with COVID on a flight. However, it's possible she was infected before the flight or after the flight. You can't be sure. Right. So, uh, so I was trying to use actual data there, not in complicated calculations, but just to say, let's not have people telling us the risk is non-existent. Sure. Even if you can't calculate it precisely, recognizing it's non-zero is worth acknowledging. Yes, particularly when you have people telling you it is essentially zero. Yeah. You know, Delta Airlines, which early in the pandemic was doing a wonderful job, suddenly started saying, now that COVID is like a seasonal flu, we might as well stop treating it as something unusual. And they got a lot of pushback for that, and appropriately so. It's not down to the level of a seasonal flu at, at this point. Yeah. Um, so, Arnie, one other topic I wanted to ask you about um, here, even real, real briefly, you know, you do a lot of work in aviation safety, and there, there's a lot of interesting articles I'll, I'll link to um, for people who want to read more. Um, in the realm of uh, elections and politics, I, I, I heard a recording of a talk that you gave about the Electoral College. Is, is, that a mis is the Electoral College, in your view, a mistake? Is it something that can be fixed in a way that might lead to more just um, outcomes that maybe more accurately reflect the view of a voting population? Well, first of all, I, I have done some work on the Electoral College, but I have not taken any view on whether or not it's a mistake. I mean, there okay. you can have an argument, a political argument about okay. how it overrepresents small states, et cetera. And others might say, no, it prevents a few states from dominating the country. So I haven't taken part of that argument. Okay. What I have done is to say, maybe there's a way of coming up with a compromise that all sides can live with. And in particular, what I said was, let each state's influence be the number of electoral college votes it has now. So to the extent that that benefits a state like Idaho, Fine, let's keep that in place. However, in a given state, instead of giving all the electoral votes to the winner there and all or nothing, divide the electoral college votes based upon the 
split of the popular votes. Mm -hmm. So if you have a state, for example, with four electoral votes and the two candidates essentially get very close to 50 percent each, then maybe a two to two split better reflects what happened in the state than four zero for the one that's slightly better than the other, where one half of the population is exalted over the other half. And I worked out what would have happened if we had this system in place, you know, based upon the patterns we saw and argued that it really had some of the advantages that people, the people who want a popular vote. I said, you know, look, in practical terms, you essentially have a popular vote. If you actually look at the outcomes under this system, they very much resemble the overall popular vote. In fact, I think it was a factor of 50 closer to the popular vote than the actual electoral college vote. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the small states get to keep the advantage they have now. In fact, ironically, it actually increases their advantage, but that's a technical mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so there, there I was just saying, here is a possible re revision, which might actually make a lot of people happier. You'd be closer to a popular vote, you would pr protect those aspects of the electoral college that people don't wanna see go away. And I've just, you know, I had the, you know, you know, threw the idea out there and, you know, I don't think, I don't think we can assume it's going to happen very soon. Sure. And is that small state advantage, for example, Wyoming with a very, very small population gets two electoral votes, correct? It gets three. They get three. It, gets, oh. it has two senators oh, and one representative. Right. Yep. That's part of the advantage is having two senators, just the same as that's California. Right. That's right. For us, that's that's really why it's nonlinear. Yeah. The number of members of the House is roughly proportional to the state's population, mm -hmm. but the two senators for a small state mean a state that really would only justify one member of Congress in the House gets three. Yeah. But again, that really, in the scheme of things, if you actually look at what happens you really shouldn't go to great extremes to try to take that away. Mm -hmm. And and also the greater weight to the smaller states doesn't really redound to one party's favor because the smaller states include Wyoming, you mentioned, and North Dakota, uh, states that go very heavily Republican, but it also includes states like, like Delaware. You know, Washington, D.C. has three electoral votes. It's the most democratic enclave in the solar system. Mm -hmm. You know, So in other words, the small states basically are pretty much matched Republican Democrat. So it, it, so doing something that would involve taking their slight influence, extra influence away, you know, it, it just isn't worth it. You don't need it to get close to your objective. And I think that's what I tried to do, basically to say, well, mathematically, mm -hmm. can we come up with a solution that for non-mathematical reasons is attractive? Yeah. And there's a difference between the math being correct and the argument of a, an opinion of which is better, red okay. state versus blue state, large state versus small state. That's different than the math that might support one choice or another. Not, that's true. And not only is it true, but I think if you do offer sort of a technical solution like this, I think it's important that you see neutral. Mm -hmm. If it sounds as if this technical solution, which sounds very abstract, is really an excuse to benefit, let's say, the Democrats, then people will call you out for that mm -hmm. and say, you know, you pretend to be neutral, but in reality, it's a scheme. It's a scheme that benefits you. But I think what I try to argue is actually that's not true. Yeah. It's not true that it systematically benefits one party. Right. And I'm not really asking this or, you know, but but people might assume and say, oh, well, you know, uh, Professor Barnett coming to us from the People's Republic of Cambridge must obviously view, you know, so yeah, that probably enters into people's analysis, even if you're trying to, even if you're being completely neutral and people will make all sorts of bad assumptions. Well, I'll tell you, it, it used to be that MIT was viewed as technical, apolitical, hmm. Harvard was always viewed as, you know, it was once Senator Mc Joe McCarthy called it the Kremlin on the Charles. <laughs> but MIT used to have a reputation as being sort of apolitical and scientific. Mm -hmm. I think, and I think it's unfortunate, MIT now has a reputation of being very much woke, mm -hmm. you might say, that it does seem to have a, a tilt toward the left. So I think that's unfortunate. And whether or not people think that 
when I make these suggestions that I look, I can't do anything about that. Sure. But it, I can say, why don't you look at what was what I'm saying and see whether or not there's you sense bias. Yeah. It's also a university, as they I, I think I heard at least once the university that World War II built. And there's a long history and association with you know defense systems. Mm -hmm. And so different people could have their their own view based on some slice of data or perception. I think, I think that's true. And in fact, MIT recently restored the requirement for the to submit SAT scores. Mm -hmm. And I think it got a lot of praise from people like like the Wall Street Journal for at least for acknowledging that sometimes objective measures of talent may have some value. Mm -hmm. So I think MIT is not viewed the same way as Harvard, yeah. but I also think MIT is not viewed as apolitical in the way that it used to be. Yeah. One, one, one quick uh, story that, that comes back to mind when I was there on campus in 1997, there, I was in one of the engineering building coffee shops, and there were what seemed to be kind of a, a gaggle of professor emeriti who would get together and have mm -hmm. coffee and shoot the breeze. And I remember distinctly overhearing a couple of uh, these, these seasoned professors complaining about the quote-unquote well-rounded students and that they had no interest in how many clubs or activities somebody was in. And, and, and one of them, I, I think this is a direct quote because this got burned in the memory. He said, nerds make for good students. <laughs> mm -hmm. so he was, I think, coming out pro-nerd, but. Yes, yes, I think that's true. I think, well, to, to get into college now, you know, they do ask uh, for all kinds of things about extracurricular activities. Mm -hmm. And that may be unfortunate. If the aim is to take people, let's say, at MIT who are most likely to benefit from an MIT education, I think the fact that you played the trumpet may not be as important as whether or not you're really good in math. Sure, sure. Well, one, one other final question for you, Arnie. You know, uh, I want to give a quick plug to what's now called the Leaders for Global Operations program that I was uh, fortunate uh, to attend. There's no way I, I, I didn't have the test scores. I wouldn't have been admitted as an undergraduate, but um, I think I benefited greatly from the LGO program. And, and you know, you, you advise a lot of um, students who are doing their internships and their, in their thesis. So kind of open-ended question here, you know, tell us what, what you uh, enjoy. This is kind of a leading question, forgive me, but what you enjoy about working with the LGO students. Oh, I do enjoy working with the LGO students. Well, my probability course is shorter now because it's believed that many of them have already had some probability and they need to learn machine learning now. Mm. So in, in, in fact, probability was, was truncated. So in addition to statistics, they can get machine learning. And I think on balance, that's the right decision but it re reduced the teaching I do. But mm -hmm. I look, I've had wonderful experiences and indeed being an internship advisor, you know, has not only been interesting in its own right, but it's actually made me a better teacher. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I remember one particular example. I had an intern who was at some paper mill in Northern Wisconsin. And, you know, in when you teach probability, there's the classic birthday problem. You know, if you have 50 people in a room, what's the mm -hmm. chance no two of them share a birthday? Yeah. And birthday sharing turns out to be much more probable than you would, would first have thought. But it sounds a little bit like a party game. You know, what's your birthday? Well, at this paper mill, they actually had a problem that when they pr produced the paper, there were certain random tears that would arise in the paper, in the page. And if two random ties, uh, tears were close together, the paper was weakened in such a way that you couldn't really sell it because if people try to write on that page, it would sort of rip apart. And they said, this is just unfair. Why does it happen so often when there are just a few tears randomly, randomly in the paper? And the response to them actually was related to the solution to the birthday problem. Namely, even though there's no need for overlap, the laws of probability say there's a very good chance you'll have some. So I enjoyed enormously working with students on projects like this because I learned things. It gave me a certain amount of street, uh, street cred. Hmm. 
of these things. And the students themselves are just a delight to teach, really nice people. Mm -hmm. uh, the summer is a wonderful time for, for that. So I have been very happy with the LGO program. And indeed, on 9-11, I was in Seattle at an LGO conference. Mm. Alumni I, conference, yeah. The alumni conference. And I, my talk was titled, Air Safety, End of the Golden Age? Question mark. Oh, gosh. And I had prepared it before the, what happened that morning, et cetera. So it almost seemed as if when I said end of the golden air question mark, I think some people thought there was no need for a question mark, mm. et cetera. But no, I, yeah. I have had very, very good uh, me memories of the program. It continues to be a very strong program. It continues to have lots of support in industry. Okay. And that's because it's a good program. Yeah. Well, and and it's it's uh, at the uh, at the risk of sounding like a circular definition. Part of why it's a very good program is uh, professors like you who are actively involved and go above and beyond. And I, you know, I think of um, you know Steve Graves and um, the late Don Rosenfeld um, as yes. as just a couple examples, and there are many, many more. So um, that's right. The, the 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 passion for the students and the teaching and the learning and. You know, it's very, very appreciated. So thank you for that, Arnie. And thank you so much. Um, real pleasure that we could do the podcast here today. Well, it was a pleasure being here with the podcast. The podcast, And I wish all of your listeners and those who watch it to have very safe flights and happy landings. Yeah. Thanks, Arnie. And so, and again, if you want to find um, you know, different articles that uh, Arnie has written, either from an academic uh, perspective or times he's been cited in the, in the news media or written op-eds. Um, I'll put links to those in the show notes. So thanks. Thanks again. Thank you.